New Sonic Team Jr. finally made a good change for once. No, they didn't. Give me that and let me see. Wait, they did make a good change? What the fuck? <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Sandwich Face, and today I've got something interesting to talk about. It's about some nice changes to the reusability system that were made recently. I've also wanted to go back and do a follow-up to my reusability video for a while now anyway, and now's a better chance than ever to go back and discuss some points I didn't think about last time. So in this video, we'll talk about just how good these changes actually are, and whether reusability itself should even exist in the first place. Stay seated everyone, because things just got interesting. So before I begin, if you haven't watched my first video on the reusability system already, I recommend you do so now. There's a link to it down in the description below, but just for the sake of convenience, I'll go over the basics again. Reusability is a sort of license that SRE2MB mods are published under. Mod creators can determine whether their mod is open assets and free for everyone to use, or if a mod is not free to use and people interested in using pieces of it must ask permission first. While it's a simple and harmless concept on paper, it tends to lead to a fair share of drama and creates a lot of issues with ports of older mods. But recently, SRB2 community staff finally made some sweeping changes to the whole system. You see, they've actually decided to start allowing unofficial ports of old mods to the forums. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but they actually made a good change for once. No more hand rigging over port legs, and no more reasons to get pissed at the SRB2 workshop for very trivial reasons. The official announcement post is rather lengthy and takes longer than it really should to get to the point, but it details some of the specifics of these changes. So are the new porting rules really as clean cut as this post outlines, or are we not reading the fine print? Is this post even well written or reasoned? Well let's read deeper into this official announcement and find out. Authors Returns Whenever the subject of reusability comes up, someone usually comes into the discussion with the 5D checkmate of, you're not making any money on your SRB2 mods, therefore why do you care? You lose nothing by letting people edit slash redistribute your work. This might sound like a winning argument at a glance, but the truth is that even when there is no money to be gained, money often never was the incentive in the first place. People will create and share their art in the hopes of gaining a lot of different things, and the returns on those things will make or break their drive to keep on doing so. Some examples of these things, which I will be calling author's returns from here on out, include notoriety, credibility, competition, self-expression, to make statements, to see people enjoy themselves. Letting people edit and repost your art, whether credit is given or not, can often directly impact all of these, the author's returns, in a way which often isn't fair to the person who put the sweat into the project. So I see we're still on this whole art community thing that I don't entirely agree with, but eh, whatever. And you know... Maybe this is just the cynical bastard in me speaking, but Author's Returns seems like a really corporate and trigger-coded way of saying clout. Especially when notoriety and credibility are the first two things that come to mind when you explain this. It just seems really apparent that's what you mean at that point, but let's continue. Notoriety. Say you're creating work with an original character who you created. You really like it, and you want to show it to the world. You may do it for notoriety, as in you literally want to be known for creating that piece of art. You are trying, through the fact that your work will stand out amidst the rest, to become a well-known artist. Someone cloning your art can easily fall into the realm of, actually, whether I am given credit or not, the fact that my character is copied wholesale by a ton of other people means I do not stand out. Now I need to change my own design in order to stand out again, this sucks. Anyway, my stance on this first point is, uh... Create things out of passion because you're passionate, not because you want clout. That's all I'll say about that. As for the second point, if you're going into this with the goal of making something popular, then you have to be prepared for knockoffs to crop up. The Japanese Henshin boom of the early to mid 70s was in response to two massively successful tokusatsu series, Return of Ultraman and Kamen Rider, both of which airing at pretty much the exact same time. It's why Tsuburaya Productions created other giant heroes like Mirror Man and Jumborg Ace, and one of the reasons why Godzilla vs. Megalon had Jet Jaguar in it. The point being, you've got to be prepared to deal with people cashing in on the success of something, that's just how the cookie crumbles. And I really don't think someone using a single line of Lua code from other mod counts as cloning art, personally. Credibility Credibility can be hard to wrap one's head around because it's such a heavily contextual reason to create something, but the motivation of I made this thing to prove something to myself or to others is definitely very real. 
If such an intentional point is trying to be made, then an author has good reason to be upset of widespread edits or modifications. It is much harder to make a point when the point you're trying to make ends up diluted or stripped out of your work on other people's whims. Any random audience member will only experience a work with fresh eyes once, after all. See, I can at least understand that first part. Some people want to show off their skills with this stuff, it's not rocket science. I can't really respond to this with anything I didn't already say at the last point, so let's keep moving. Competition. I'm not a competitive person, so it's hard for me to relate. But it's safe to say that a big reason why a lot of people create is specifically to outdo others at a craft. Few sane competitions will let someone submit an edit of another person's work. Whether it's an official contest or a contest in someone's own head, this matters to some people. Competition is what drives innovation in pretty much any industry on Earth. It's not hard to find someone who thinks gaming was at its best in the 90s when Nintendo and Sega were constantly at each other's throats trying to outdo each other. But I'm also not sure what relevance this argument has to SRB2, because modding is a community effort and nobody's competing with each other at anything. And New Sonic Team Jr. has done their part in removing any semblance of competition from the community by making the old DC a collab. I mean, it's a valid point, but it can't reasonably be applied to SRB2 modding. Self-expression. You may have created your OC specifically because you want to be understood by people, through them engaging with your art. This stuff can get very personal and vulnerable, and not only will people fiddling around with your personal work hit a little too close to home, but it will also impact the ability for people to experience you through your art, if it enters the public domain and loses the consistency and tension you write into it. Now listen, I don't know about you, but I download mods to play mods, not to experience people. I review bad SRB2 mods, not bad... people experiences? God, how would you even phrase that? I've also never seen an SRB2 mod get personal and vulnerable before. Are you sure we're talking about the same game here? See, I disagree with the idea of SRB2 being an art community because of this weird type of grandstanding you do where you think this is all some kind of high art that should be put in a museum. Like, yeah, sprites are art, music is art, and even levels can be considered art, no one is debating that. But in no universe would I ever put any of it on the same tier as the fucking Mona Lisa, that's just a completely ridiculous notion. To make statements, if your work is specifically created as a statement piece, social, political, artistic, whatever it may be, other people copying it and not catching on to that nuance can dilute it in a way that's very frustrating for the author who put it together in such a way. SRB2 has nuanced socio-political viewpoints? What the fuck have I been missing out on? Was the Chaotix mod actually an allegory for the Cuban Missile Crisis that just flew over my head? Is the true identity of the Zodiac Killer buried somewhere within Silverhorn? I mean, fuck me, dude. You know what I just said about this weird grandstanding about SRB2 mods being like high art or whatever, right? Yeah, same thing applies here, except this one's even more of a head-scratcher. Like, what are you talking about? To see people enjoy themselves. This is actually the most fundamentally human of all reasons. You create something, you want to be there to see others enjoy it. If people copy your work, they actually get to steal the dopamine rush of Here's the thing! See my thing! What do you think? Because others may just go, oh, we've already seen that before. No, a creator creates things for other people to enjoy. You've got this fundamentally backwards. The dopamine rush is for your audience. This doesn't really apply with the reusability system either, because the copying usually comes from a work that's already been published. It just seems unusually selfish to make something that's for an audience more about you than the audience you made it for. I don't make videos for myself, I make them for the 2,000 people who are subscribed to my channel. I don't make videos to fuel my ego, I make videos to inform and entertain people. As a creator myself, these talking points are just a really self-serving and terrible way to look at the creative process. It's not a labor of love, it's all just a bid for attention. It's not about the satisfaction of creating something for other people to enjoy, it's about you and nobody else. This is what I'm getting at here. Content creation is not a selfish activity, it's a selfless activity. Going into something like this, you have to be aware of the possibility that you are not making this just for you, you are making this for other people and they are going to play this. And they are going to say things about it like, hey, I liked this, or I didn't like this, or I didn't understand this, could you explain this further? Now, I'm not saying you should be a slave to other people and do exactly what they say at all times. I'm just saying you gotta be aware of the fact that when you make something and publish it on the internet, other people are going to download it and enjoy it, and the audience matters more than anything else in a medium like this. 
Anyways, there's a lot of regurgitation of variations on these points in this post, so I'll just cut the parts that are actually worth responding to. If that feels like a hard pill to swallow, here are some helpful analogies. Converting a JPEG to a PNG is objectively a form of editing someone else's work. It completely changes the encoding structure of the image. In fact, this is something that Discord and Twitter do automatically all the time. Why do we not call that a trespass? When you dump a ROM off a cartridge, you are very much editing the work as you remove it from its original casing and extract it into a format playable on a different device. And yet, this is something that can't even be made illegal. When you're giving a framed photo, it is absolutely modifying the gift if you take it and put it into a nicer frame. And yet, people wouldn't usually care about that the same way if you would, say, drew on the photo. Why is that? Only the third analogy here is a kind of a good one that makes sense. The image format conversion one only works if you make it a PNG to a JPEG conversion, as you're converting a lossless image format to a lossy image format. And the ROM dump one is just fucking stupid. What, does this mean that Super Mario 64.Z64 ROM I downloaded from CoolROMs.com when I was 10 is actually a ROM hack now? Your view of what constitutes as editing is very skewed to say the least. Kind of a relevant tangent aside, let's continue. These next parts are about how reusability has failed when it comes to ports, and honestly it does make a lot of sense and tracks pretty well, but then you just get to this. Along the years, the Mona Lisa has been reframed, restored, and reproduced all over the world so that people can continue to enjoy the work of art it is without needing to go all the way to the Louvre. Sorry if I butchered that, I don't really speak French. And yet, each faithful reproduction can be appreciated with the same amount of respect to Da Vinci's artistic intent. We can absolutely allow the same level of accessibility to our community while still guaranteeing our modders work the respect they deserve if we focus on what really matters. <sighs> you know what? I'm gonna say it. I think you give SRB2 a really overinflated sense of importance. You will not become the next Leonardo da Vinci by making a momentum mod for SRB2. Like, I understand the analogy you're trying to make here, but like, come on. People are here to make mods for a free Sonic fan game, not to make high art. This shit right here is why people make fun of Sonic fans. And finally, we've reached the important TLDR of this announcement. A list of changes being made to the reusability system that allows unofficial ports to be submitted to the message board. Hallelujah. As for the actual new rules regarding ports on the message board, I don't have many qualms with them. Obvious things like a port should be faithful to the source material and the port has to actually work. You know, all good things are here. And most importantly, you can actually host these things in the master server now, so thank god. There's one catch I can see to all of this though, and it's this right here. If the author returns to maintain their own work and wishes to host an official update thread, unofficial ones may be delisted or locked, up to whatever the judges think is best depending on the situation. This pretty much means that every single unofficial port that will ever be uploaded to the message board going forward is on a metaphorical death timer. Better hurry up and make those ports before the original creator phases back into existence and gets it taken down. My only request here is that if this scenario were to ever occur, that the unofficial port thread becomes locked and not delisted, as I really do not want any unofficial ports to become lost media. But overall, these aren't bad changes. Sure, these are just small steps of progress, but actually seeing things around here improve for once brings warmth to my cold Ultra Warrior heart. But as good as all of this sounds, there's been something I've been meaning to talk about when it comes to usability, and it's something I really didn't touch upon in the first video. You see, after some research and some discussions with friends and other programmers who know a thing or two, I've come to a startling realization. Reusability is a GPL license violation. So if you've ever looked at the source code on the SRB2 GitLab page before, you've probably noticed this little license document right here. This is the GNU General Public License commonly referred to as the GPL license. It's not just a text document that says, Hi, your mod is open source. Thank you, come again. It's a detailed, legally binding license agreement that comes with a whole lot of rules regarding its usage. And if you publish something under a software license, you have to follow its rules. Basically, this is the thing that makes SRE2 open source, and it has to follow the rules outlined in the GPL to stay that way. So right now you're probably asking, Sandwich Face, where's the license violation? On the FAQ page for version 2.0 of the GPL license, the version SRE2 source code is licensed under, you'll find this. However, when the interpreter is extended to provide bindings to other facilities, often but not necessarily libraries, the interpreted program is effectively linked to the facilities it uses through these bindings. 
So if these facilities are released under the GPL, the interpreted program that uses them must be released in a GPL-compatible way. The JNI or Java Native Interface is an example of such a binding mechanism. Libraries that are accessed in this way are linked dynamically with the Java programs that call them. These libraries are also linked with the interpreter. If the interpreter is linked statically with these libraries, or if it is designed to link dynamically with these specific libraries, then it too needs to be released in a GPL-compatible way. Another similar and very common case is to provide libraries with the interpreter which are themselves interpreted. For instance, Perl comes with many Perl modules, and a Java implementation comes with many Java classes. These libraries and the programs that call them are always dynamically linked together. Now, the consequence is that if you choose to use GPL Perl modules or Java classes in your program, you must release the program in a GPL-compatible way, regardless of the license used in the Perl or Java interpreter that the combined Perl or Java program will run on. So, what does this mean exactly? Well, let's break this down. A Lua modification being loaded into SRB2 creates a combined work. Think of it like modifying an old, shitty desktop PC. Taking out the old hard drive and putting in a new one doesn't create a new computer. It modified the original desktop and becomes a combination of two things, making a derivative work based on the desktop PC and the new hard drive. It is now a combination of two efforts by two different people. You can say the same for SRB2's Lua. The Lua is interpreted using bindings for SRB2's C functions. In English, it means C functions are being called by Lua. They're connected together. Now, the C functions that Lua mods use extensively are written with the GNU GPL, meaning that anything that creates a derivative work must be licensed under that same license, meaning it must be freely modifiable by anyone. It is entirely unviable to create a mod that doesn't use C bindings. There are zero mods that I'm aware of that don't use these bindings, as even basic building blocks for mods like adhook and consprintf are simply bindings to the GPL licensee functions. Overall, this means that mods that contain Lua are required to be freely modifiable by the user and distributable with those modifications. Anything else is a violation of SRB2's license. Still too wordy? Ugh, sorry about that. The subject matter is pretty complicated, I'll admit. But in layman's terms, because SRB2's Lua implementation directly links into SRB2's own GPL license code, all SRB2 mods with any Lua scripts whatsoever need to be released in a GPL-compliant way. Here's another good example from Wireshark, an open-source tool I have used to teach myself various computer networking concepts. Beware the GPL. Wireshark is released under GPL, so every derivative work based on Wireshark must be released under the terms of the GPL. Even if the code you write in Lua does not need to be GPL'd, the code written in Lua that uses bindings to Wireshark must be distributed under the GPL terms. There is at least one Wireshark author that will not allow to distribute derivative work under different terms. To distribute Lua code that uses Wireshark's bindings under different terms would be a clear violation of the GPL. If it isn't clear to you what the GPL is and how it works, please consult your lawyer. So if it wasn't clear enough already, reusability is not GPL compliant because it is effectively distributing derivative works of GPL license code under different terms. Now reusability could still apply to SRB2 mods if they had no Lua in it whatsoever, but you won't find many mod these days that don't have even the tiniest amount of Lua code. Essentially, reusability only covers edge cases like, say, a custom character with a default ability such as the homing attack, or a custom level or level pack with no Lua in it at all. So, if reusability isn't GPL compliant, why is it here at all? Well, to get the answer to that question, we need to go back to that message board post I read earlier. The reusability system isn't new, nor was it invented by me or any other member of current staff. It was implemented by staff in the final demo to 2.0 transition 14 years ago, who have since moved on to other things. Anyone with a decent level of SRB2 history knowledge can probably tell what's up here. Reusability was put in place during the transition to version 2.0, which predates SRB2's Lua implementation that was added in version 2.1. So what this really means is that the reusability system is just... outdated. It was put in place before anyone in the community had to worry about Lua or before anyone knew what a Lua even was. Sure, it might have been GPL compliant back in 2010, but now it's just not fit for this Lua-centric SRB2 modding landscape. The future is now, old man. Overall, the new changes to the reusability rules regarding ports are a great step in the right direction for the community, but that doesn't change the fact that the rules in general are a gross violation of the GPL license. They're outdated guidelines that were fine 10 or 15 years ago, but don't really hold up now. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, but I don't believe art community and free software really go together. Art is often a strictly proprietary medium, while free software is strongly against proprietary anything at all, 
and fights to make software free and open for everyone. Art is mired by tricky copyright law and litigious creators, while free software often abides by a copyleft approach, where it really doesn't matter who uses what. Like oil and water, they just don't mix. Wow, that was a pretty big one, goddamn. Sorry if the new Sonic Team Jr. video got put off yet again, but I'll have more time to work on it soon, in like a few weeks. Just give me a little time, alright? But on a brighter note, thank you everybody for helping me reach 2,000 subs. I am so thankful for your support, none of this would have been possible without you guys. I love ya. I'm planning out a 2,000 subscriber special with my friends, so keep an eye out for that. Anyway, I guess that'll be it for this video. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and join the Trashbin Central Discord linked in the description down below. Peace out, and good night.